Good evening, everybody. It's really, really good to see so many of you here. Um, we are expecting quite a few people tonight, um, so we will just wait for a couple more people to join and then we will get started. Um, you should all have access to the chat functions and the Q&A, so please do use those throughout the webinar. And we will also have quite a lot of um, interactive polls throughout the webinar. Um, so we hope um, that you will join in as much as you can. Um, and if you do have any questions for any of us, please just do post them um, throughout and there will also be time for questions at the end. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome everybody to our Introduction to Clinical Decision Making webinar. Um, this is going to be applicable to any pharmacy student, any graduate member. Um, basically, what we'd like to get you to get from this tonight is an idea of the factors that go into making clinical decisions. Some ideas about what you might, what factors might factor into prescribing decisions. And um, this is particularly applicable to anybody who will be qualifying um, as an independent prescriber, having a lot of thought behind what you're prescribing. And any even anybody who's not thinking about becoming an independent prescriber, understanding the thought process behind the prescription. We're also going to have three case studies that have been written by our trainee pharmacists here tonight. Um, which should give you a good range of content from different sectors of pharmacy um, and help you kind of prepare a little bit for things that you might see um, in the wider world of pharmacy. So I'd like to introduce myself now. Uh, my name is Kieran O'Brien. I'm the Secretary General um, of the BPSA and I'm currently doing my foundation training year in a acute hospital trust in the south of England. I'd like to introduce to my team. So team, introduce yourself. Reshmi, you're next on the list, so. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, I'm Reshmi. I'm the Publications Officer for the BPSA, and I am a Bradford Sandwich student. So I have done the first six months of my foundation training year in a community pharmacy in Bradford, and I will be continuing the second half of my training year in Northern General Hospital in Sheffield in January 2024. Sally, go ahead. Hey, everyone. So my name is Sally. Um, I'm the graduate officer for BPSA during this mandate. Um, I'm also a uh, foundation trainee. Currently, I am working in a GP practice um, for the first six months. And then in the last six months, I'll be working in uh, Torbay NHS Trust. Um, so that's going to be very interesting. Hi everyone, my name is Sue and I am BPSA's competition coordinator and I am also a foundation trainee. I'm training at Great Ormond Street Hospital, so it's a paediatric hospital and I'm very lucky because I love it. <laughs> um, and I realised that Emma's list, Emma's name is not on the list, but let's mention Emma. <laughs> yeah, go on Emma, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Emma, I'm past competitions coordinator and I'm vice president of BPSA now. I recently newly qualified in August and I work in community pharmacy for the past two years. Lovely. So all of the team have worked really, really hard in producing all of the material tonight. The webinar will be recorded and then we'll hopefully shortly go live on our YouTube channel um, in up to two weeks time. So you can always refer back to this um, at a later date if you need to. So we're going to jump straight into it and we're going to have a quick discussion about the importance of taking a holistic approach. So what I would like to hear from you guys who are in the webinar is what do you think taking a holistic approach means when we talk about treating your patients? So use the chat function, use the Q&A, share your thoughts, and then we'll have a discussion about what we think it means. So we've got using higher order thinking skills, absolutely really important that you're using all of your knowledge, all of your critical thinking. Think about the patient as a whole, not just their medications. This is such a massive part of it. And what we're seeing in pharmacy in particular is that we're moving much further away from just looking at a patient's medical history, we're involving the patients in the decision-making process and having them really have those discussions with them rather than for them. 
patients' genetics, um, race and ethnicity, absolutely. Really, really big push on genomics at the moment um, in medicine. Patients, the number one priority, yeah. Compliance, very, very important with the patient, and we will touch on that a little bit later. Pharmacological and non-pharmacological intervention, yeah, definitely. Consider the patient's well-being, absolutely. And we will touch a little bit on something called social prescribing a little bit later, which is something that's quite new. Um, and hopefully after this webinar, you'll have a little bit of a better idea about how social prescribing uh, can help with the patient. Considering all the factors, social emotional needs, prevention, as well as treatment. Yeah, all really, really great answers, guys. So these are the things that we came up with. So there is no one size fits all. And a couple of you guys mentioned it, but basically you have to treat the patient as an individual. When you're making prescribing decisions, when you're making decisions about a medication, you have to treat every patient as an individual. And this is particularly important when you're treating patients who have sort of similar illnesses. You can have two patients with hypertension, but you may treat them in completely different ways. And it's important that you approach every single scenario with kind of a clean slate, go in there and start from scratch to make sure that the patient gets the most out of it. Then we've got lifestyle versus clinical. And this is another really big one is kind of, is there a need to treat? And sometimes the best treatment is no treatment at all. Would you give a patient any tablets, a, you know, a large supply of tablets they're taking three or four a day when actually could you manage that with just lifestyle changes? But of course, the flip side of that is, do they need to make a change now? Is it something, are they at risk of, or are is it a long-term risk? And that would also affect your treatment plan. If the patient is at risk of heart attack in the next month, you'd probably want a sort of a very quick solution. But if they are just at risk of something, you can probably afford just lifestyle changes and careful advice and counselling. And then we talked about shared decision making, which a lot of you picked up on. And we've already talked about it is involving the patient every step of the journey, giving them the options to then take further and decide their own course of treatment, because that in turn will then help with their adherence and their compliance. A patient is more likely to take a medication that they have chosen or a medication regime that they have chosen than if you just force an option on them. And then if we've got social prescribing, so Sally, you're a bit of an expert in this. So do you want to just explain a little bit about social prescribing? Yep, Kate, for sure. Um, so social prescribing is a very interesting concept. It's been implemented um, in the NHS five-year long plan. But you, if you have had work experience in a GP or if you're working in a GP right now, you may see that there are clinics for social prescribers or social workers. So essentially what social prescribing is, is taking into account different elements of patients, connecting them to their community, um, to different services, in which necessarily does not mean starting them on a new treatment, but actually taking um, a look at other alternative options um, that helps change their overall mental and, and physical well-being. So it really does coincide with this holistic approach um, that we're trying to tackle. So essentially, it's asking the question, you know, what really matters to this patient is taking time to understand their condition um, in all aspects, not just looking at them based on their, you know, drug history, medical history. We're taking a look at their um, lifestyle. We're taking a look at what they like to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and this is a really um, effective plan for patients, especially if you're looking at patients with multiple comorbidities, having a really hard time managing a long list of medications, a long list of conditions um, that can sometimes put them in a very poor um, mental health, actually. Um, and, you know, we, we speak a lot about like how patients are in pain, you know, and pain is that one crucial um, component that could actually be tackled with this social prescribing method or social prescribing approach. It's for patients who feel lonely. They feel sometimes quite isolated from people. So in a way, social prescribers can say, well, actually, you can go and maybe join this gym, your local gym that is close to you or join a dancing class. I think he's going to share a really interesting story as well about that. But it really is just taking a look at the patient, not based on their conditions, not based on 
their medications, but based on what they would want and how they can basically gain control back um, or empower them to gain control of managing their conditions and, and living life to a, a better, like a higher quality. Um, but yeah, that is essentially what social prescribing is. And it is um, so something that's implemented within an NHS that has been working for many years. So um, it's really great to see the impact of this um, this practice as well. Yeah, you kind of alluded to it, but I remember I attended um, the ESLI conference last year and I met one of the kind of biggest social prescribing forces um, in the UK. And actually he's pushing for this nationally. And he shared a story about um, a lovely old lady. She was in her 80s and she came in um, very often for just the the most, you know, random of issues. You know, she'd always come in for an, a, a random ache and a, a random pain. You know, she wouldn't be sleeping and she had multiple comorbidities. You know, she had chronic pain. She had anxiety. She had depression. But actually, when they looked into it, they actually found out that her husband had recently died and she was living alone. And so they referred her to the social prescriber who suggested that she actually go to a local salsa dancing class. It sounds mad, I know, but she did that and they reviewed her in six months and they took her from 13 medications down to six. They got rid of her anxiety meds. They got rid of her depression medication and a lot of her pain medications because she simply didn't need it. And I think that is a real shining example of the impact that social prescribing can have and when we definitely should start looking at actually do we need to prescribe a medicine here or is there something else that we can do that we don't get into this kind of circle this vortex of prescribing and you see it so often where a patient comes in with one thing so they'll be prescribed a medication that then causes a side effect that you give another medication for that then interacts so you change the medications and you once you get into that cycle it's very difficult to get a patient out of it um so it's really really great to hear that story but did anyone else on the team have anything that they wanted to share about sort of taking a holistic approach? Any stories from patients? It's okay if not, guys. <laughs> I think I have I have kind of a holistic approach. Um, I think because I work in peds, um, it's also like age plays a really big factor just because if you have like a really small baby, obviously their parents are going to manage it. Um, but if you have like someone in their teens, um, you might want to start getting them involved before they kind of transition into adult care. So I think um, having like insight into who you're talking to and how to tailor that information, because um, you would use very different terminology if you're speaking to an adult to, um, compared to like a seven year old. But you would obviously still want to talk to the seven year old, like don't neglect them. So I think that is quite important from Pete's perspective. Definitely. And something that's very interesting in pediatric patients is if they if you know that they're going to be on long term medication, getting them involved with those kind of decisions and helping them understand from an early age really, really helps with adherence later on because they understand the medications. They understand that importance. And actually, if you do it from an early age, it becomes routine for them. So a little tip if you're ever dealing with pediatric patients that have long term conditions, start start early. So we're going to move on now and Rachel is going to talk to us about the importance and how we carry out a clinical decision making process. So Rashmi, over to you. Thanks, Key. So I'm sure we've all we have um, joined because, you know, we want to know how to make a clinical decision. But what exactly does the process of a clinical decision making entail? So I'm sure um, so some of you may be students, some of you may be trainees. And the thing is, we actually have been carrying out clinical decision making as early on in our first year of university and during our MPharm degree in, you know, our prescription processing classes and our dispensing classes. So essentially what clinical decision making is, first of all, is gathering all the information presented to you. So, you know, let's say you are presented with a prescription or a patient comes into you and you see they've got some meds and then they say that, you know, I've been commenced on a new antibiotic course of clarithromycin, for example. But then when you look at their long term prescribed medications, they're taking, you know, um, a statin, for example, and that is a very big red flag, obviously, as we all know, it's one of the biggest red flags because of the interaction between both of those medications. And then, 
you know, sometimes the patient might say, oh, I'm having side effects from, you know, this new medication, my antibiotics is making me throw up, is making me nauseous. So you've got to have, there's two problems that one is like flagging that interaction. And then the next one is also, you know, finding a treatment for the patient to help them deal with those side effects. So, you know, you're gathering that information from the patient and then you come to the next part, which is basically the reasoning. So, you know, let's say a patient's on an antibiotic, you know that you can't ask the patient to stop an antibiotic, you know, because obviously it's very important because of antimicrobial awareness that patients finish the, the antibiotics that have been commenced on to make sure that infections are completely eradicated. And so you would have to then weigh the benefits versus risk. And then you'd have to think, well, okay, so if a patient has to take the antibiotic, would it be possible then for her to withhold the statin for a few days while she's on that antibiotic, for example? So that's using your judgment, you know, outweighing all the options. And then finally, you come to a decision and you say, okay, you tell the patient, you know, while you're on this particular antibiotic course, you take it until, you know, for however long you prescribed it for. And in the meantime, while you're on that particular course, for example, you just stop taking your statin in the meantime, because if the patient has been on a statin for a long term, like for a few years at that point, chances are it's not going to affect them as adversely if they stop it for a few days versus if they suddenly stop taking the antibiotics, for example, you know, that could mean that the infection might come back. It could mean like a whole other slew of problems could arise. So that comes to your decision making at the end of the day. And then at the same time, you'd also want to like check with the patient, you know, how is your nausea treating you? How is like, how are you coping with that side effects? And then maybe possibly having a discussion with the patient, just reassuring them that, you know, nausea, vomiting is quite a common side effect with antibiotics. And then perhaps maybe prescribing them like an OTC medication, like Bucastem, for example. So it's sort of like having all of those factors come into play and you work through them each step one by one. And then you finally come to a decision at the end of the day that it's patient-centered and safe. Lovely. Thank you, Roshmi. And it leads really nicely on to what we're about to talk about, which is actually factors that influence prescribing decisions. So for those of you who are watching the webinar, could you name some factors that you think would influence a prescribing decision? If you were going to write a prescription, what are the kind of things that you would be thinking about? So age, gender, yes. So definitely patient specific factors, past drug history, allergies is a big one, absolutely. Ooh. Lou just gave you the answer there. Formulary, yeah, we're going to touch on that one. Past drug, drug history, absolutely. Making sure that all you have all of the information that you need. Liver function, body function, yeah. So again, sort of more of the patient factors. And this may differ as well. One of the interesting things that when we were coming up with this webinar, because we all work in different sectors, we all had different almost priorities when thinking um, about things that influence prescribing decisions. And you'll hear a little bit about that as we go through. Formulation, yeah, big one. So here are the ones that we came up with. So national and local guidelines. So something that I noticed, so I, I work in um, University Hospital Southampton. And one of the big things that I noticed when we started was actually we use a lot more of our local guidelines than we do the national guidelines and that is down to a, a huge variety of factors you know how expensive is the medication what is what do we normally use the treatments for how easy is it for us to get stock of that medication and so we will use the local guidelines based on what we do and what we find works and these may differ from the national guidelines so when I was looking at some prescriptions, I was thinking that doesn't look right going off of what I know in the BNF and NICE, but actually it fits within our local guidelines. And as a practicing pharmacist, that's something that depending on where you work, you may need to, or you may come into contact with and you may need to think, well, actually, is there a local guideline in place that states this is what we do compared to what the BNF states? The other thing is evidence-based medicine. Sue, do you want to walk us through evidence-based medicine? 
Yes, um, actually, I have one thing to add to your previous point as well. Um, it's to do with like the local guidelines. I think that's particularly important for antibiotic prescribing, just because around different areas and like different cities, you'll have different resistance patterns. So, um, I think antibiotics every trust will have their own antibiotic guidelines, and it's just really important to follow them because um like resistance is such a big thing now um which leads really nicely onto evidence-based medicine <laughs> um and like this just means like what research is there to back up the treatment that you are giving the patient so um because I work at quite a specialist hospital like a, a lot of evidence I read about is like different case studies because um there have not been a lot of cases so like you can't really find much information in say nice guidance um because there's just not really been enough numbers um to like spot trends so we kind of look at say for example a condition in a patient that happened in america and then we'll kind of use that as our baseline so what dose did they start off with was the condition the same um what did the patient look like so how are their bloods um and then just kind of compare that to the patient that we have in the hospital um as an inpatient and then see how like we can deliver the care yeah, I think the other thing with with evidence based medicine, I mean, we Pete is a great example of this because there's not a lot of guidance or any guidelines written because to have that you need to have done clinical trials, and no parent I've ever met is going to willingly volunteer their child for something that may cause a reaction just to see if it does cause a reaction when there's a safe alternative. So you only have evidence based medicine to go off of. Um, so that's why things may look different. But actually, if there's the evidence to back it up, I remember our trust started using sildenafil to treat um, pulmonary hypertension in pediatric patients, which at the time they introduced it was everybody thought they were mad. But actually, there was the clinical evidence to back up that decision. As weird as it was, it did improve patient outcomes. So sometimes the evidence is all you've got. And that leads actually quite nicely um, on to formulation, which Sue, I think you're going to talk about as well. Yeah, um, I think I'm more exposed to these like evidence-based medicines and formulation problems just because I do work in peds. And I think um, in pharmacy school, I didn't really, I mean, I did know about formulation, but I don't think I actively thought about it that much. But um, in peds, it's so important to ask, like, are you able to swallow tablets? Um, and even like check, can a tablet be crushed? Can it be dispersed? Can you open a capsule? Like what medium can you disperse it in? Um, and I feel like, um there's a lot of tubes as well so can you crush things down an mg tube and nj tube um and you don't have to know all of this information i think you just have to know where to look so if you're giving something intravenously big use resources such as medusa um and then i think new guidelines would be for like the tubes and things um but if I think formulation is related to cost. Like if the patient is able to take tablets, then um, that's a really great option because it's very convenient. I think also less expensive <laughs> compared to liquids. Um, and what else is there to do with formulation? Um, oh, expiry. Yeah, like uh, tablets will last so much longer and they have um, like a really good shelf life compared to formulation. Sometimes you have to store it in the fridge um and it's just making those like patients aware about how to be able to administer and store it safely yeah and i know what we're speaking about is is mainly hospital based but to those of you in gp and community formulation still plays a massive factor because you will be seeing patients particularly with comorbidities like arthritis parkinson's dementia if you're going to put medicines in a little bottle, does it need to be a brown bottle because the formulation is sensitive to light and will degrade? If it's going into a, a nomad tray, is it safe to be taking out of its original packaging? If the patient struggles with um, you know, taking pills out of the packet, would they be better on a liquid formulation? And you'll be at the forefront of making and helping with these prescribing decisions because especially in community, you will get to know these patients, you will get to know your regulars and you will understand their limitations. So this is not just hospital specific, you know, that you will encounter this as a pharmacist in any sector. 
So the other thing that we're going to that we came up is local formularies, which I think Sally, you're going to cover on this one. Yeah. So local formularies is a very key and important feature that you will find across hospitals, GP practice, and certainly community pharmacies as well, especially if there's prescribing involved. Um, and essentially what a local formulary is, is basically there to set standards for best practice. You know, you're looking, the local formulary is created by a group of experts. They bring in um, resources based, and then they also evaluate the high quality evidence-based um, resources on why certain medications are prescribed for certain conditions. It also helps reduce the variation in the level of prescribing within a certain area as well. So if you have a look at your local formulary, it may be diff um, it will differ within the areas that you're in, within the regions that you're in. So something that um, a drug that is commonly prescribed as first line um, within like the southern area may differ up north and this is based through also studying the populations and seeing what works best in certain areas. It also may vary depending on the settings as well. So you're working in hospital and you're working in GP. There are many range of medications that you would not expect to be started in GP, but could be commonly started in hospitals as well. The main thing we have to understand and why local formularies are so important actually is because it helps reduce cost as well. It helps reduce the prescribing of very high cost drugs um, that in GP would not, we would not recommend to start that drug within this sector, so primary care, but it may be started in secondary and tertiary care. And that is very different, but within the local formulary, you will have that information. So that will help um, not only help you understand the cost effectiveness of things and the clinical decision making process, but also helps um, to, because it's from a smaller list of medications as well, um, it helps the prescribing process. It makes prescribing actually easier um, in a way, and it narrows down all the options that are available for you. So if you do have access to your local formularies, I would recommend to familiarize yourself with it. Um, if you work in GP, you know, have a look at what your local formulary is. And have a look as, as well, what is first line, what can you suggest to be prescribed in GP and what we can expect different sectors like secondary care to start um, for the, the, the management of the patient as well. It really helps um, strengthen the continuity of care for that particular patient and communication between different sectors of pharmacy. Yeah, Sally really sort of with that last sentence, you know, hit the nail on the head. It's all about continuity of care. and. If that patient is on the same medication when they get it prescribed in the GP, collected from their community pharmacy, get admitted to hospital, they're on that same medication, it makes everybody's life so much easier. There was a question in the chat about the difference between local formularies and local guidelines. And a great way to think about it is you have the BNF, which is the British National Formulary, and that is a list of drugs that you can use to treat certain conditions. The local formulary is just a smaller version of that. So you'll have hospital gp and community pharmacy in an integrated care board they all get together and they say for hypertension we want to use ramipril first line then amlodipine that's what we want to do and then you've got your national um you know formula that says you can use any of those um to treat hypertension and then your guidelines are more of a how you would treat a condition um, so a local guidelines, um, Sue mentioned about antibiotic prescribing um, and sepsis is a, is a great example. And because often that is decided by the variations of resistance in your area, which does fluctuate depending on which part of the country you're in. Um, so the national guidelines may say that you should use a certain antibiotic before another, but the local ones would recommend that you use um a different antibiotic because people in that area are less resistant to it but it, a good way to think about it, a formula is your list of drugs and the guidelines are how you treat conditions in very very simply so sue also touched on cost a little bit earlier and this is something that i feel because i've worked in community pharmacy i've experienced it in gp and i currently work in hospital and cost is something that I never really worried about, and now I do. Because when you're looking at a medicine that you would prescribe to a patient, you have to think about, do you prescribe 
Um, the, like one key argument is the branded versus generic. And there are some patients that will swear blind that they must have a specific brand of tablet. But if you're working in community pharmacy and that specific brand of tablet costs 60 pound, but the generic version costs three pound per box of 28, it really is a no brainer which one you choose. And I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but community pharmacies will always prescribe or always supply a generic um, item against a prescription unless otherwise, unless the, it's, the brand is stated in the prescription. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yeah. So, and it's very similar in hospital as well, you know, but the other thing that we think about, particularly in hospital, um, because you see it a lot more with things like intravenous drugs, is when you're buying or purchasing ampules of drugs and thinking about how you could maybe split the dose. Um, so instead of buying one, maybe one 75 mg ampule, could you maybe buy one 25 and 150 for half the price? And it's the same with tablets, you know, if you were going to give um, one to five mi uh, micrograms of digoxin and 62.5 micrograms of digoxin to make up the dose, would that work out cheaper than one tablet that covers the whole dose? And very often it does. But then we bring it back to the patient factors. And is the patient able to take two tablets? Are they going to take two tablets? Are they going to remember to do it? And is there that risk that if we give them two, they might only take one and underdose themselves? So I hope you're starting to see that all of these factors really, really link in with each other. So we also came up with interactions with other medications. I mean, this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, and as Roshmi mentioned earlier, um, when you look at a prescription, check the drug history, talk with the patient, see what they're on. Um, and if there are interactions, think about what your process will be. Are you going to change the medications they're currently on? Or are you just going to give them a new medication that doesn't interact? And sometimes it you would need to change the original medications. But again, you have to have that discussion with the prescriber, with the patient, you know, come up with that shared care plan. We then have supply chain and stock problems. Massive issue in any sector, I think we all will agree. Um, and very often what we prescribe is completely influenced by what we can get. Um, and there will be times that you have to change medications because you cannot get a certain item. Um, and it's just how you communicate that with the patient and making sure that they understand if it's a long term or a short term switch and the implications that will have. But the main thing that you're going to tell your patient is actually there is not going to be a change to their treatment. The pack might look a little bit different. Um, it might taste a little bit different. If it's a tablet, different brands, some people think they taste different. Um, but the important thing is that their care is continued. It is the same medication. And then we've got legal and ethical facts. I can't remember who was going to talk through that one. I'm hoping someone is. <laughs> I can I can talk through it a little bit if you want. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I think those two can be separate things actually, but with legal factors, um, a lot of you who are trainees, pharmacy students, no matter what stage in your training or in your um, learning uh, development process, you will come to understand that there's a lot of legalities and regulations that you have to follow through and, and fully understand and also implement during your practice in the future. Because really, when you go against certain legal um, uh, you know, regulations, it does lead to sometimes trouble. <laughs> as well in, in a way where and and usually you have to sort of understand that there are reasons why these um regulations are there it is to maintain uh the highest quality delivery of service and also safety with the patient as well so understanding why those legal factors are there for instance when I work in GP, a big part of what I do as well is not only do I suggest changes to medications or I did suggest changes to treatment plans, I also communicate that to my team, making sure we all agree this is the best plan for the patient because, um, yes, it's important to use my clinical judgment. 
judgment, but it's also important to recognize your limitations, recognize um, you have to work within your own competency. And then if you have any questions or there's anything you do not understand is to communicate that to someone else um, more senior to you. And then we come together and make the decisions. And once a decision is made, um, we have to document it. We have to record um, the rationality, the, pro the thought process. And like I said, this does coincide with um, promoting continuity of care because then the GP can pick that up and fully understand, okay, yeah, this medication is suitable for this patient based on their weight, age, um, preferences. Um, but if, you're, if you've not written all of this down, if you've sort of just given the patient a medication, it would seem quite random. So it's important that, doc and people do overlook this quite a lot of times, but you have to implement documents documentation because it is a legal form of communicating your thought process and communicating what the um, best action plan for the patient is. This is applicable to all sectors of pharmacy, community, um, when you're working in GP, even in hospital, especially in hospital when you have a very hectic day and you see many different patients with many different indications, it's important that you always communicate what it is the plan is for the patient and why that is the case. So that's why you have to use a lot of your clinical thinking skills throughout this process, because you can't sort of randomly come to an agreement that this is the right choice. There has to be um, justification and rationality behind it. But that's just one of the legal factors. I mean, I think you guys can name a few as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, anybody who is a trainee or any student, you know, read the MEP because you will be tested on it. And that covers all of the legal things that you need to know. Um, but the, another re actually important ethical factor that doesn't really get discussed because it's quite specialist, um, particularly to mental health, is something called covert administration. And covert administration is something that as a pharmacist, you are likely to be asked about because it a lot of it comes down to things like the formulation of the drugs. Is it safe to put in certain mediums and things like that. And this is if the patient needs to take a medication, but isn't accepting of the fact they need to take a med medication, or they may have some sort of mental health condition that means they are not capable of making those decisions for themselves. And this is where you have covert administration. Now, covert administration, firstly, you have to think, is it ethical to be giving this patient this medication? And that comes down to, is that medication going to save their life? You know, if it's something like an antihistamine and all they are is a bit itchy, are you really going to covertly administer, you know, administer that? But if it's something that, you know, without it, they might die, you know, maybe something like um, an anticoagulant because they're at risk of DVT or an anti-epileptic drug, you know, where they, without that, it could cause a significant risk. Then, you may think actually, yes, we need to covertly administrate that. And then from the legality side of it, there's a whole load of paperwork involved. And often you have to be part of a multidisciplinary team that are all agreed on it. A minimum of, I think, three signatures on the paperwork. Um, so that's a really great example of where ethical and legal factors will all um, coincide together. And it's quite mental, mental health specific. But if you work in a hospital, you may be um, asked about this if there is a mental health patient on your ward. Um, if you work in a medicines advice service, but also if in community or GP, you have any patients with mental health difficulties who get admitted, they may contact you if patients get their regular medication from you. So that's just something to think about. And then our final two points before we go on to the case studies are things like patient factors and patient contraindications, which we've kind of spoken about already. I don't know if anybody has anything they want to add to this. I'm going to take that resounding silence as a no, um, which is absolutely fine. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to the case studies. So we have three case studies covering different sectors. Um, each of us have uh, written one. So what we're going to ask is that we will have interactive polls. So please do join in on the polls. Um, we have checked and checked and checked these, but there may be things that we have missed or gotten wrong. Um, if that is the case, we do humbly apologize. Um, but yeah, just do raise it with us and we can look into it. And if you have any questions, um, please do ask them. 
but also bear in mind we may not have all the answers we will do our best um but we may not be able to answer everything so we're going to move on to our first case study now um which is a case that i saw when i was working in community pharmacy um obviously no patient details so this patient is a 37 year old caucasian woman um, she has recently, uh, or she's come in asking for calcium tablets. She was recently in hospital after a small fall. She broke her arm and she was talking to a friend who recommended calcium and vitamin D to kind of help with the healing process. And you get talking to her and she sort of jokingly says that she's been forever breaking one bone or another ever since she was 28. And you want to have, you just, you know, out of interest, you want to see um, if there could be an underlying cause. So you check her um, profile, her SCR with her consent. And you see that she, you know, has been on regular estradiol since she was 29. So my first question for you guys is, could there be an underlying cause? So hopefully you can all see a poll. I'm really hoping you can all see a poll. I can see people answering the poll, which is great. And remember, it's all anonymous, guys. So there's absolutely no, you know, no shame if you get the wrong answer. We won't know. So just have a go. So 100% of you think, yes, there could be an underlying cause. And yes, I, I agree with you. So now I want you to start thinking about actually what the underlying cause could be um and just to help you out we've given you a list there so again all anonymous so don't be afraid of putting an answer if you think it's wrong sorry he just sorry to interrupt i think some of us might want to see the and the question again, the main bulk of the, the question, just to quickly. How do you mean? <laughs> um, so they can see the question on the poll, but the original patient, um, the patient details like the. Oh, yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> Scenario. Yeah. There you go. So you've had a minute to answer. So the majority of you think that it is osteoporosis. And I'm going to say I agree. Um, the reason for this, that kind of the main giveaway was that the patient was on estradiol um, at age 29. Um, and that is the main form of HRT for menopause. Um, and what's really interesting is that early menopause or patients with early menopause often have worse bone health and are more at risk of things like osteoporosis um, and menopause so low estrogen levels are correlated with declining bone health that's that's the main reason behind it um, and the reason it does that is that estrogen inhibits the osteoclasts um, which sort of cause that bone resorption but actually promotes the formation of osteoblasts I think I think that's right do correct me if I'm wrong. That's right. But, yeah. Blast for building. Yeah, which is really counterintuitive. Um, so, yeah, so it's osteoporosis. So now we're thinking about high risk groups. Um, this could be something that comes up in your exam, understanding um, what is a high risk group and what isn't. Um, just to let you know, there is a mistake on the second option. It should say a patient with a BMI of 23, I believe. So li little mistake there. Do apologize. So we'll just give you a minute to answer that one. I 
Now remember the question is, which of the following is not a high risk group? And this is something that we see in a lot of exams. They like to trick you up by saying, or putting the word not a high risk group in. Um, so little tip from all of us, always read the question um, and read the question twice, read the question three times. So majority of you thinking it's patients with a BMI of 23, a couple of you going women who undergo early menopause, long-term smokers, men over 50. So the answer is patients with a BMI of 21. As I say, I, I do apologize. There was a spelling error on that. Um, but the main reason is, um, and the main thing that you need to take from this is that anyone with a BMI of under 19 is classed as underweight. And underweight patients are more at risk of developing osteoporosis. Um, early menopause, it's well known that estrogen has protective effects on the bone and maintaining bone density. So those who undergo early menopause, um, they will have less estrogen, which will lead to a decline in bone health. Long-term smokers, we all know smoking is a health risk and osteoporosis is no different. Men over 50, bone density starts decreasing at that age. Um, so that's just standard. And then patients on long-term corticosteroids often also um, have long-term corticosteroids. But patients with a BMI of 21, not a high-risk group. So if the slides want to change. So which of the following is not a hormone related risk factor? So read these carefully is, is my advice. Uh, I can tell when everybody finished reading um, all of the options because there was a sudden influx of answers. It was brilliant. Okay, so majority of you think that they are all hormone related risk factors. And I agree. Um, it's a slightly misleading question. I know. But yeah, all of these are actually hormone related risk factors. Um, anything that involves a gland is generally hormonal is, is a good way to think about that. Um, answer number three, reduced amounts of sex hormone. It's got the word hormone in it. Um, and then disorders of the adrenal glands, as we said. So if it's got a gland in, it's almost certainly a, a hormone related. So just to give you a quick summary of osteoporosis, um, it's a health condition that weakens bones. It makes them more fragile, more likely to break. It develops slowly over several years, but there's no real way of diagnosing it. It's only diagnosed when they have a bone break or a fracture. Um, and in the UK, over 3 million people are estimated to have it. And there's roughly 500,000 fragility fractures that occur. And the main thing that's important to us as pharmacists is understanding that the two main preparations used to treat it are calcium and colocalcid roll preparation and bisphosphonates. And those are the two licensed um, ways of treatment for osteoporosis. And I'm gonna be quiet because I believe the next question <laughs> is about the treatment of osteoporosis. Yeah. So which of the following would not be appropriate for the treatment of osteoporosis? Would not be appropriate. Okay, all of you guys were really quick on that one, which I love. Um, so majority of you thinking methotrexate, and I agree. So all of the rest of them are licensed in the treatment of osteoporosis, very simply. 
So going back to what we were saying about kind of taking a holistic approach to our patient, we've all agreed that this patient's likely suffering with um, osteoporosis as a result of early menopause, but we now need to consider the best treatment options for them. And we should think about patient compliance as well as what is first line and what is second line. So with that all in mind, what is the most appropriate treatment plan for our patient? So I'll give you a chance to just read through all of those before I start the poll. So this is one of those great examples of a single best answer question um, because to an extent all of these are correct so it's about thinking which one of these is maybe the most correct option And also thinking about our patient. So just as a reminder, she is a 37 year old Caucasian woman. Um, she's on regular estradiol, um, no other regular medications. And we don't know anything about her sort of social history, so. So this one's a slightly trickier one, but it's actually a really great example of the things that you might see in a community. For a community pharmacy actually is probably where you might see this the most um, because patients will ask advice, what they can do, what they can't do. And it is expected that you as the pharmacist will be able to give kind of tailored advice to that patient. Yeah, um, exactly. That's, um, you know, and especially with something like alendronic acid, which is a biphosphonate, there are many, many counseling points for that. So, you know, like sit upright for 30 minutes after you take it. Don't take any like um, indigestion remedies. Always have good dental hygiene. If you report any, if you've got any like um, hip pain, thigh pain, femur pain, like go to your GP immediately. So it's just like not like, you know, I've got like a lot of counseling points removed, especially for biphosphonates. Yeah. And yep, yeah, so most of you thinking alandronic acid, and yep, yeah, I agree with you. The main reason for this is that alandronic acid is the first line. Um, she's already on hormone replacement therapy, um, so there wouldn't be we that pro that probably wouldn't we wouldn't put them on more HRT. We'd be introducing a bisphosphonate at this stage in their treatment. Um, and we've given them lifestyle changes, um, which is really, really important, but also understanding the limitations of a patient when you're giving lifestyle advice. Um, it may actually be that they are not able to do certain things. You know, you can't recommend to a patient with arthritis to go and run a marathon, you know, to try and lose weight. So always make sure that you're tailoring your advice to the patient and understanding their limitations. So now a couple of quick questions on actually alandronic acid itself. So what is a normal dose of alandronic acid for females? Just as a little um, sidebar, alandronic acid is one of those medications where depending on the sex of your patient, the dose will differ and there may be more than one right answer. So let's have a look, see what everybody put. So majority of you going 70 mg once weekly, couple 10 mg OD, couple 5 mg BD. And the answer is 10 mg once daily or 70 mg once weekly. So if your patient is a female, um, they can take either. And it would be entirely dependent on the patient themselves 
which they would take. Some like to take it daily because they can get into a routine, take it on the same time of day, and it'll help them remember. Others prefer the once weekly dose um, just because they don't have to take as many tablets. Um, men, however, can only take 10 milligram once daily. However, 70 mg once weekly is an unlicensed use. Um, and all that means is that the manufacturer says that they shouldn't. Um, and if the prescriber was to say 70 mg once weekly, they would be assuming personal responsibility if anything was to happen to that patient. So it's really important as you're doing your training year or as you're doing your studying for your M farm, understanding what unlicensed preparations mean um, and the potential implications of that. So supporting advice, this is really important when you're talking to a patient. There are lots of things that they need to know. Rachel touched on it when we're talking about counseling points, um, which is a big one. Also understanding supportive therapies, um, if the patient needs to go for any monitoring and things like that, blood tests, are they regular, are they not? If they are regular, how regular? Um, so non-drug related therapies in particular, that can be things like fluids, oxygen, raising of limbs. Um, but you should always try and give a little bit of supportive advice to your patient saying, actually, this is something else you can do that might help um, or avoid that. So with that in mind, which of the following is the most appropriate advice to give to this patient? If I can find the poll. That'd be great. And actually, a lot of these things Rajmi actually did mention a little bit ago. So <laughs> this is a really great test to see who was paying attention. So a majority of you have answered now. And the majority think it's all of the above. And yep, I do totally agree. All of these things are pieces of advice that you should give to your patient um, when you're talking to them. And especially if you're counseling them on a new drug, these are all things that you should either tell the patient or understanding or helping them understand that they have the patient information leaflets, um, which these things are often stated on. Um, one of the things that we need to make sure we do as pharmacists is informing the patient of things that they need to do and should avoid on the medication, but also not scaring them into not taking the medication. So all of these points are really important that you tell the patient, but there might be a situation in which you say, actually, I'm not going to tell the patient all of these. I'm going to say, refer back to the pill if you have any sort of queries about things you can't do. And there are other things that you might be able to gauge when actually talking to the patient. You know, things like, do not take this medication if you are pregnant or breastfeeding. Well, when talking to the patient, you can have that conversation say, are you or could you be pregnant? Are you breastfeeding at the moment? Okay, just so you know, you know, you don't need to ask that as quite a forceful question at the end that you might do when you're talking about some of the other counselling points. So I think that is everything on my first case study. So Sue, do you want to take it away with yours? Um, yes, I just wanted to ask, were there any questions for Kiri's case study before we move on? Um, so they're just easier to answer. Okay, I'm just going to take that as a note, but just put in the chat um, if you guys do have questions. Um, I'll be doing talking, so Kieran has more than enough time to answer. <laughs> um, am I doing the poll as well, Keith? I mean, you should have access to the polls, but I can do it if you'd like. Yes, please. I'm not the most tech-savvy person. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so patient two is actually um, a little bit simplified patient. I saw this um, during my first rotation when I started at the hospital. Um, 
So the patient who is called Master Vinnie Christine, so you can tell it's a cancer med. Um, so this is an eight-year-old Hispanic male, and he is currently being treated for um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, that's ALL, and he has come in for his intrathecal methotrexate. So we'll be looking at um, the kinds of meds he's on and what supportive care um, like might go along with these medications. So next slide, please. Thank you. So, okay, before we dive in, let's just have an overview about ALL because before I started at the hospital, I had no idea what acute lymphoblastic leukemia was. Um, but essentially, it's a cancer that affects the bone and the blood. Um, and I'm not sure how much cell biology you guys know. I will put it in very simple terms. I'm not that good at cell biology, but <laughs> um, we have like your blood stem cells and then they will differentiate into your myeloid and your lymphoid cells. And then uh, from those two branches, you've got further differentiation. So um, with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, you've got a problem with um, the differentiation of lymphoblasts and your lymphoblasts are meant to differentiate into your B cells, T cells and your natural killer cells. Um, so you can kind of see that there is like a problem with immunity. Um, so the way we would go about treating this patient is to stratify them based on their risk. So the way we do this is um, look at their prognostic factors. And there are lots of different factors um, such as age. So like when were they diagnosed? Um, and we'd look at the white blood cell count and we have a look at whether um, they have like CNS involvement. So CNS being like central nervous system. And then depending on whether there are good or bad prognostic factors, we then determine the treatment regimen. There are lots of different treatment regimens, um, which I won't really go into much detail about because it's very specialist and we don't really need to know it. But um, based on his age, um, Vinny has a good prognosis because people that are diagnosed um, ages 1 to 10 uh, or in between, they have a really good prognosis compared to someone, for example, that was diagnosed um, like age less than 1. So that is quite a bad prognosis. Um, however, he does have some bad prognostic factors. So um, he has some CNS involvement and his white cell count is quite high. Um, which means that these lymphoblasts, because they're meant to be in the bone marrow, um, like it's kind of proliferated so much that they've like squeezed out into the blood. So that's why you have white cell count in your blood. You're like you're not, you're not really meant to have um, like a very very high white cell count unless you've got an infection. So that's one of the markers that we'd have a look at. Um, and then the CNS involvement is bad because we would measure like we take a sample from the cerebral spinal fluid. And then we just see like how much white cell, um, if, if there are any um, white cells in there, and he does have some. So we've determined his treatment regimen is gonna be treatment regimen B. Um, they're called ABC by the way, the treatment regimens, um, but we've gone with B and there are the drugs on the right that he is on. So you can see he's on some immunosuppressants. So you've got the steroid like dexamethasone, and then you've got um, his, uh, an oral and intrathecal methotrexate and 6-MP, which are also immunosuppressants. Um, methotrexate is also cytotoxic. Um, and then you've got his anti-cancer medicine, uh, vincristine, hence his name, vincristine. And you've got cotrimoxazole. So cotrimoxazole is this antibiotic. Um, and the reason why he needs it, as you probably can guess, is because he is immunosuppressed. So being immunosuppressed means like your immune system doesn't really fight off infection very well. And um, you can kind of, you're more at risk of getting something called um, pneumocystis carni or pneumocystis jivarecki. Um, So we just abbreviate that to PCP or PJP. It's just a condition that affects your um, lungs. And normal people can fight it off fine, but because like he is immunosuppressed, um, he does need a bit of help because it can be quite fatal if if he does catch um, PCP or PJP. The next slide, please. Okay, so um, my first question is, what kind of analgesic is most appropriate if Finney is to have pain relief? Ooh, I like mixed answers. 
<laughs> Makes sense and means we'll learn a lot. So I'm happy. Okay, I think. Um, so we have actually a split between all of them. Um, we've got mostly paracetamol and opioids. We've got some NSAIDs, some AEDs. Oh, AEDs, I should, oh yeah, I put in brackets, that's anti-epileptics. Um, so the answer for this is actually opioids, um, but I'll go through that. Um, can I have the next slide, please, Key? Um, so I'll go through one by one, or maybe two by two. <laughs> um, so paracetamol and NSAIDs, the reason why we don't use that um, even though they are quite commonly used in kids, it's because it can mask a fever. So fever is one of those really important observations that we would do and monitor um, on our patients because it can be a sign of infection. And obviously with them being on immunosuppressants, anti-cancer meds, and like them being in quite a vulnerable state, we we need to know if they have an infection or not. Um, and if they're on paracetamol enters and they spike a fever, then and it's hidden um like by these meds then we can't like we just can't see and then they, they could deteriorate really quickly and we can't we won't give them any more antibiotics we won't send them for testing or anything because we just don't know so that's why we don't do that but also i think if you have cancer and you're undergoing chemo um that it can be quite painful um and i just feel like the cover on uh, options one and two just wouldn't really be that like adequate and like remember pain um, is quite an important management and like thinking holistically about the patient that like we, we do want to be thinking about how we manage their pain. Um, and I think, yeah, this isn't actually, um, it's not very, I don't know if you need to know or not, but it's very interesting. So I'll tell you guys anyway, but um, there's something called cytokine release syndrome. So if you're using really targeted therapies for the patient, so um, by targeted, I mean, like antibody therapy. So there's a medicine called um, blinatunumab. Um, can't remember exactly how it works. <laughs> Probably something to do with T cells and B cells. Um, but there is a risk of something called cytokine release syndrome. And it's very bad. Um, and you do need to like sort it out. Like, there is like a full guideline and management and things uh, for it. But one of the signs of cytokine release syndrome is fever. So again, that's another reason why you would not want to mask the fever because there are just, it's just such an important observation that we have to do. Um, and then opioids, like I said, um, this is the one that we would do just because it gives adequate pain relief. Um, and I think one thing to mention with opioids is just to have naloxone on the side as well. And I know that at uni, we learned that naloxone is like for overdose um, and like for kind of addicts and things. But um, if you look in the BNF, the, um, there is actually like low dose opioids um, to reverse side effects um, because like these are children and, you know, Vinny's eight, um, like they are a smaller build, they are at risk of side effects. So having opioid on the side, if like you see that his O2 sats are dropping, um, so things like respiratory depression, CNS depression, um, like then they're quite nasty side effects. So we do want naloxone on the side to reverse those effects, but you have to think like, because it is an opioid antagonist, um, like we don't want to reverse the pain either. So <laughs> it is like a fine balance. And then anti-epileptics, um, we just wouldn't really use them. Uh, they're, they're quite like interacty and they have lots of side effects. Um, and I think the mechanism that they work is like mainly neuropathic pain. So not really by which the same mechanism that pain is really caused. Okay, next question. So it says um, penicillins, ziprofloxacin and PPI, so proton pump inhibitors, are contraindicated in patients taking methotrexate. Why do you think that is? I also don't expect a lot of people to know this just because it is a bit um, specialist. <laughs> um, so like, just guess if you're not sure. I didn't know either. You can Google it if you want. Um, <laughs> it's really interesting though. It, it's, it's one of those things as well. Pharmacokinetics is something, I mean, talking from personal experience, I was like, oh, pharmacokinetics, never gonna never gonna use it don't need to bother and then i've hit training year and i'm like oh i really need to know pharmacokinetics and you need to know what is 
an antagonist? What is an agonist? What is an enzyme inducer? What is an enzyme inhibitor? These are questions that, okay, maybe they will or won't come up in the exam. Almost certainly they will in some form or another, but as a pharmacist, you absolutely need to know these things. Yeah, it's so true. Um, I think when I was studying this, I was like, who actually needs pharmacokinetics? <laughs> and then when I was asked the question, I was like, you know what, maybe I should have studied a bit harder pharmacokinetics, but never mind, you know, we learn every day, so it's okay. Um, so as I expected, there is, is quite a split on this one. Um, but the answer is decreased methotrexate clearance. Um, so the reason uh, is, is basically um, the medicines like well, the penicillin, Cipro, and the PPIs, um, they decrease methotrexate clearance um, by a different mechanism. They don't all do it the same way, but they all decrease um, the clearance. And that can be through blocking um, or competing for transport proteins. Um, so if you have like another protein competing, no, another drug competing for like a protein that you need to clear methotrexate, then you will naturally have an increased serum like concentration and of methotrexate, therefore increased risk of toxicity. I think I saw someone flash their hand up. I don't know if I was just seeing things. <laughs> so if there is a question, um, yeah, feel free. Um, I might not know the answer, but I can always give it a go. <laughs> um, I think one more thing to add um, about methotrexate um is that it's renally cleared so it, when you are looking at um a prescription like you know say the case i've given is quite a standard like cancer case like leukemia case um but this is not including any of the conditions that they might already have it's not lo um, looking at any of the other meds so do you think like are there any other drugs that might be cleared renally that might compete with methotrexate? Um, and, you know, look, think about your nephrotoxics that might have interactions um, and like potential dose reductions from that. Like you don't want the patient to have AKI whilst you have to manage their cancer. So, yeah, it's just taking that holistic approach again. Uh, next question. What do we need to prescribe with methotrexate? Hint, there may be more than one correct answer. Yes, it's multiple choice, guys. And it's not all of them. That's your clue. <laughs> it's very promising that I'm seeing lots of folic acid. Um, <laughs> Okay, so yes, um, like a lot of you said, folic acid. Um, yeah, you can share the answers. So um, I'll do folic acid first. I think that's the one that we all know about. So if you see methotrexate, always prescribe folic acid. Um, and that's just because methotrexate, the way it works is it inhibits this um, enzyme called dihydrofolate reductase. Um, and you basically inhibit folate production. Folate you need to make um, purines and obviously, that makes up your DNA basis. So if you inhibit purine synthesis, that means you can't make DNA, and that means the cell dies, or that you, yeah, the cell dies. Um, so, but this affects all the cells. So you actually have to make sure that you supplement this folic acid so your healthy cells can still make DNA. Um, so the reason why we prescribe fluids, um, I didn't know this, it's actually, so we call it um, pre and post hydration, um, is just to decrease the toxicity or decrease the risk of toxicity. Um, and that's because like Vinny, he is on a lot of methotrexate. So he's taking oral methotrexate and intrathecal methotrexate. Um, so he is quite at risk of toxicity. Um, other factors that you'd be thinking about that could increase risk of toxicity are things like um, like folate deficient folate deficiency so if he doesn't have much folic acid already um then his cells are more likely to be affected um because they can't produce our dna um, and then intrathecal use like i said um and then the second one we need an antiemetic because um it just has quite a high mastogenic potential which just means like it's quite likely to make you feel quite sick um did i add the medicines on um Okay, so I think the medicine should show up in the next slide. 
Yeah, okay, don't answer the questions yet, but <laughs> let me talk through the meds. So we've got folic acid added, and then we've added on Dancitron as our antiemetic because um it's actually really interesting. The way that methotrexate makes you feel sick is because you have um serotonin receptors in your chemoreceptor trigger zone. So that's in like an area in like your brain. Um and because on dance on Dancitron is a serotonin and a 5-HT3 antagonist, um it will block the serotonin receptors in the CT stead. Um, so we will pick the antiemetic then, um, like the methotrexate makes you feel sick by, if that makes sense. Um, so you're blocking that mechanism. Um, and then for the uh, laxative, we picked macrogol and sodium picosulfate. And macrogol is your osmotic laxative. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Osmotic laxative. And then depending on how um, constipated they are, sodium picosulfate, um, which links very nicely to the next question, because sodium picosulfate is a super, super strong laxative. Um, it's a you know, stimulant one. So the next question is, um, which out of Vinny's meds is the most constipating? Ooh, interesting. Okay, so um, most of you answered morphine, and then some of you answered fincristine, 6MP, um, and no one thinks dexamethasone is constipating. Um, so actually, you guys that thought morphine was the most constipating were like me, and we got it wrong. <laughs> um, it's actually been Christine is very, very constipating. Um, so, you know, uh, oh, you know, on the next, on the slide before, I forgot to mention that methotrexate, actually, can we go back to the next past slide, sorry. So the reason why we actually did not give a laxative is because methotrexate can actually cause diarrhea. Um, that's a very common side effect. But because um, Vinny is on so many things that can cause constipation, then Christine being like the main culprit and morphine as well. Um, that's why we have to give a laxative, even though like previously, like, you know, methotrexate causes diarrhea. Um, yeah, and that's it for that one. Mm. Yeah, I don't know about dexamethasone or 6MP, but I know that for constipation, then Christine and morphine, then Christine being the main one. Okay, should we add a PPI? So think about this one, because uh, before we said the PPIs interact with methotrexate and will increase risk of toxicity um, by competition. Um, and then, um, but you know, we have to think Vinny's on dexamethasone, isn't he? So should we give him gastro protection? Oh no, I lost my poll. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, ooh, it's very split. I know, it's like, should we or should we not? <laughs> okay, stop it there. It's 50-50. It's okay, I can say it's exactly 50-50. <laughs> um, so the answer is yes, of course we should give PPI. Um, yes, we want to protect poor Vinny's um, <laughs> stomach lining. Um, dexamethasone can be quite like irritating so that is really important and um, so the approach that we would take is just to leave a um, 48 hour gap between the ppi and the methotrexate dose um so like there's no risk of methotrexate toxicity and we're still protecting the gastric lining um yeah and that's everything for that one Okay, what side effects should we counsel Vinny about for the dexamethasone? So this is your classic steroid side effects. Um, and then I'll also talk through about what we would have to monitor as well afterwards. This is also a really classic question where they will give you four seemingly exactly the same statements with maybe one <laughs> or two word differences. Um, it's very true. I had a lot of fun making this question, I can't lie. <laughs> Sue woke up and chose violence when she made this present made this question. But Not it's, gonna lie. Yeah, yeah this gives me flashbacks to my yeah. own 
Absolutely. And it's, but it's really important that you read every statement really carefully um, because they are so similar. Um, so it's testing a lot of things here. It's true. I think if I didn't write it and know the answer, I'd probably get it wrong from not reading the question properly. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, ooh, mm, yeah, it was semi there. So we had answers for options one, two, and three. Oh, did I? Not read that. There we go. And um, the answer is number one. So the classic side effects of steroids are weight gain, uh, hypoglycemia, so high glucose, and um, osteoporosis, mood changes, and sleep disruption. So especially long term, um, you can get, um, Sorry, I'm a bit distracted. I'll read that. I have seen your <laughs> comment. Um, I'll read it later. Um, so weight gain, the hypoglycemia and osteoporosis are very common for long-term side effects of steroids. Um, and weight gain as well. So these kind of make your monitoring parameters. So especially in kids, you'd measure their weight, you'd measure their glucose levels. Um, and then I think counseling points definitely mention like the mood changes um, to parents, like your kids might be a little bit like touchy, a bit grumpy. <laughs> um, but it's not just because they're hormonal, it's because steroids can do that sometimes. Um, and we'd also mention like sleep disruption can be something that they might struggle with as well. So we tend to say that if they have to take like um an afternoon or evening dose, like actually no, not the evening dose, um, an afternoon dose to make sure to take it um at the latest 4 p.m. I don't know if that's like my hospital thing or like an everywhere thing, but because it can cause sleep disruption, um, we say 4 p.m. at the latest. Um, and I think you know when you're just in dispensary um just make sure that you are giving like the steroid cards and you are giving that counseling um steroid cards are for like long-term people and or high dose but uh, i can't remember how many weeks it is but if they're on high dose for like an x amount of time that's in the bnf <laughs> um we have to give them a steroid card as well um the consultant asks why she cannot give Vinny his vin Christine since he's already here? What is your response? Whilst you guys are answering for that question, I'm going to answer my question, <laughs> um, this in the chat. So is the 48 hour in between methotrexate index and methazone to reduce toxicity and the same reason why folic acid is to be taken 24 hours after methotrexate? Um, so I think folic acid doesn't necessarily have to be 24 hours after methotrexate, but just not on the same day, because it would defeat the point of... Um, they, they just counteract each other's mechanisms. The point of the folic acid is kind of like resupplement in what methotrexate is doing to the healthy cells. So, you know, methotrexate, the way it works is um, by stopping the folic acid production, so folate production. Um, and you need the folate to um, make the DNA for the cells to work. But um, because it affects your healthy cells, like that means it will kill them off as well, but you still need healthy cells to function. So that's why we have to give the folic acid in. So I think just think of the folic acid as something we have to resupplement in, but we don't want it to make the, to like block the mechanism of methotrexate. Otherwise, like what's the point um, of giving it? Um, and the 48 hours um, was referring to the time you would leave between um, the PPI dose and the methotrexate and you're right in the sense it's dexamethasone because you would give ppi with the dexamethasone um but that is to like you said reduce toxicity of methotrexate it's not really to um resupplement anything in if that makes sense um so by leaving uh, i don't know which one you would do first to be honest but if you have like a, a two-day gap um you are able to then clear the methotrexate because there's no like competition for like say renal excretion, um, which we discussed before. Let me know if that makes sense. Um, if not, I can try and explain it again later. Yay, okay, nice. <laughs> um, and then for this question, so why, oh, you all got it right, I'm so proud. Okay, um, so yes, this is actually really, really important because um, with, 
like intrathecal um, administration, like vincristine, because it goes. Oh no, I shouldn't say because that's the next question. Um, <laughs> it's okay. I remembered. Um, but yeah, it's like you know, intrathecal methotrexate is part of the cancer treatment plan, but um, it's very neurotoxic. No, vincristine is very neurotoxic. Um, if we give it intrathecally, so that is like a no-no. We never do that. Um, and clinical governance measure, um, is basically the steps that we are taking to reduce this risk of fatal neurotoxicity, because we know that when you give vincristine intrathecally. Um, it can basically kill the patient. We just completely like want to mitigate this, and we say we're not even going to like bring vincristine near it when we're <laughs> when we're doing intrathecal methotrexates, um, which is kind of the primary reason why Vinny has come in. So we'll just do like vincristine on a different day, um, when like he's not getting his intrathecal methotrexate. I think we would give vincristine IV. I think that's the only way we can administer that medicine. So. It's just good to know because, you know, I don't think cancer is highly weighted in like the peerage exam. But one they always ask is like, what can you do with vincristine? And it's always don't give it intrathecally because it's neurotoxic. OK, but well done, guys. Oh, yeah. That's, that's one guaranteed mark for all the trainees in the room. Yeah, it is one guaranteed mark. <laughs> OK, what is the intrathecal route? This is just a bit of anatomy. I don't think it's that important, but it's just also one of those like cool facts to know. Um, <laughs> if someone says like giving it intrathecal. Okay. I think I will stop it there. Um, we do have some answers for everything. Um, the main one being number three, so administration into the CSF in the subarachnoid space. And um, that is the correct answer. Um, I don't really think there's much explanation to it, to be honest. I think it is just anatomy. Um, yeah, and you would just do that via the spine. So the it's actually, I went to see one. The needle is really, really big. If you think like, I was going to say the size of your hand, but I, I then I think like we all have different size hands, but it is like a way bigger than average needle. Um, and then they just like, um, I don't know how they do it, but they, you know, they feel for like space between um, the spine and then they just have to like shove it in. Um, very interesting to see, but also very scary. The absolutely most technical description of how they put in a, a, <laughs> a CSF needle there. They just shove it in they do it actually looks really quite horrifying um but you know it's it's for a good cause so um yeah that's why i'm not a surgeon <laughs> okay um which drug requires testing for g6pd um don't worry if you don't know what g6pd is we'll go through it um like on the next slide so you don't have to wait that long <laughs> One thing to note is that we spoke a little bit earlier about how up and coming genomics is. Um, so questions about genetic testing will almost certainly be coming up in M farm exams. We can't speak for the registration exam, but it would be good to know, I think, certain um if certain genetic profiles are enzyme super metabolism um, super metabolizers mm -hmm. or like where they are slower metabolizers i think that one has the potential to be quite a common one particularly anything to do with um cy six three eight four oh that one as well yeah yeah the codeine one as well <laughs> the yeah. codeine one's a very popular one um i think g6pd i don't know i knew it at uni but i don't know if it's like covered in the curriculums or not but anyways if you haven't heard of it now you have um <laughs> So, oh, we have a mix. Um, so the most popular one was 6MP. And then when I mean, Christine and Cotrimox seem to be tied. And then I think second most popular is methotrexate. So the answer is Cotrimoxazole. Oh, that was so well-timed. Thank you, Kieran. <laughs> um, so, 
Yeah, I don't think this is standard monitoring actually for cotrimox marks because you see cotrimox marks everywhere. Um, I'm at, I'm not hundred percent sure exactly why, but I feel like probably because they're cancer patients and the long they're on it long term. Um, but it's actually the you know cotrimoxazole is made up of two components, isn't it? So you've got the trimethoprim and you've got the sulfur methoxazole. Um, and it's actually the sulfur methoxazole that um is the component that would need like testing for G6PD deficiency. Um, if you go into the next slide. Oh, <laughs> I feel like they're more helpful for me than prompts. It's probably okay, I'll explain it to you guys. Um, okay, so G6PD, so G6PD stands for um glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, horrible name. It's an enzyme basically, and we need this um to protect the red blood cells from oxidative stress. Um, so if you don't have this, your red blood cells will be subject to oxidative stress and then just die. So that's not good. Um, but G6PD deficiency, so if you are deficient in this enzyme, um, it's often inherited. So it's an inherited disorder. Um, and like that's why you would need the testing. And I think there are a few things in cancer medicine or like cancer treatment that you'd need this for. Um, testing form and also not in cancer medicines but you can google the list like it is a bit everywhere I didn't know there were that many drugs but there are um and if you basically give a medicine that um you cannot give to someone that is g6pd deficient uh, it can cause something called hemolytic anemia um so it's like the red blood cells die basically um <laughs> so that's why it's just really important to monitor because especially with leukemia patient um it's already like a blood disorder so you really don't want to be um causing hemolytic anemia on top of that i think is that me done yay so just before we move on to our final case study of the night does anybody have any questions regarding um sue's case study if so put it in the chat or the q a box now um and of course feel free to ask questions um throughout so we'll be able to answer them um just in the chat so i think sally if you want to take it away yeah i just wanted to say sue that was very intricate and very great explanation of all those terminologies i don't think i think before we had this workshop i had no idea half the things that you explained to us so that was really really great and i'm sure Many of us on this um, webinar has found it really helpful. And um, if you don't know it before, you know it now. And it's it's really great to sort of stimulate more curiosity and, and learning in the process. Um, OK, so my case is the last case study. Um, so this patient, Sam Staten, is a 69-year-old lady. She was admitted to A&E at 9 a.m. So I've provided you details um, a bit about her um, past medical history. So this case is a case that you would you can expect to see in a lot of GP cases. Um, so it's usually patients who's been um, discharged in hospital, has been in hospital, and they have continued of care in GP land. So, um, oh yeah. So she is a smoker. She lives with her husband, um, and she does require carers to come in on a daily basis. She's taking a simvastatin, a lodipine, and a um, and she also has a drug allergy the penicillin allergy um so what happened was the patient um uh patient was found by her care at 8 30 a.m they found her slumped in her sofa unable to speak or move uh, and then later in hospital after um, further assessment examination they she was then treated um, for ischemic stroke so this was based on a diagnostic various um, diagnostic tools were used such as a ct scan and that was the main tool that allowed them to then make this diagnosis and what happened was there's um, formation of embolus in her cerebral artery okay sorry i think we whiffed through that really quickly but the first question um so which of the following would not contribute to her developing this ischemic stroke so this is sort of looking at your risk factors of a stroke so um and you will find this information mainly in enough um nice guideline I think a lot of us do tend to familiarize ourselves, especially after learning more about different cardiovascular diseases. Um, so yeah. Okay. 
think we've got okay I think the large majority of us has basically said dyspepsia and that is correct because everything else you see on that screen are contributing risk factors whether they're modifiable or non-modifiable um they are risk factors to stroke so hyperlipidemia that means that is a very high levels of lipids within your bloods, um, increasing your risk of forming arthrosclerosis or blood clots as well. Um, and smoking, as we said, smoking does contribute to a lot of um, health complications. Uh, most importantly, with the development of a blood clot, it, it, it basically causes your bloods to become more almost like it's not solidify, but it does thicken your bloods um, because of the components that um, is found within the cigarettes. So essentially smoking is a risk factor, especially if you smoke um, quite a bit over a period of time um, and hypertension as well. So if you sort of have hypertension or um, signs of heart failure, um, atrial fibrillation, or basically any other, or any other heart conditions, ischemic heart disease, these are risk factors that can contribute to you then having a stroke as well, because the main thing here is there's um, sort of dysregulation to your blood flow, you know, hypertension causing blood pressure to go really, to go high and be very inconsistent at times. Um, so yeah, that 100% does contribute to um, developing a stroke or a heart attack in the future as well. Um, other factors, like I've mentioned, if a patient has heart failure, if a patient has diabetes, um, if a patient has like chronic kidney disease as well, um, and most of these risk factors will be found, you can be found in the guidelines as well, but and also other non-modifiable risk factors um, could be like age as well. So as you get older, um, usually your bodily functions tend to be to not function to their full potential. And therefore, it could lead to you developing comorbidities and therefore leading to you having a higher risk of stroke or cardiovascular events. But dyspepsia, because dyspepsia um, essentially is... Um, so dyspepsia is basically an umbrella term for um, inflammations or complications within your stomach lining, whether that is in relations to um, excessive acid production. So that could be presented as gourd, um, or it can be also uh, the development of ulcers as well. But usually with dyspepsia, um, it is not as complicated as where you get to the point where you have like gastric bleedings or ulcerations, but it is a factor to causing those further um, stomach complications as well. And there are certain medications that you take if you have dyspepsia. Essentially, when patients are presented with this condition, and this is a little bit unrelated, but um, it's good information anyways, um, is usually they will have to undergo testing for um, H. pylori. So that's usually the bacteria that's prominent um, for sort of disrupting your stomach stomach lining, um, causing a change in your um, sort of like bacteria flora as well, um, and leads to further complications. And that's usually when treatment um, is very much prompted. But anyways, unrelated. Um, okay, next question. Okay, so this question, uh, so let's have a think about what this, what we could expect this patient to be prescribed immediately after this diagnosis was made. Because remember, a stroke is a very, it is a life-threatening condition um, and it has to be, be dealt with um, very quickly as well and to ensure that a patient is stabilized um, and increases the risk of survival as well. Okay, we've got some good answers. Okay, so answer one, two, and four. Interesting. All right. Okay, we'll stop there. Okay, so the majority of you actually did get it right. It is thrombolysis with Alteplas within 4.5 hours. And I will explain to you why those um, individual uh, phrase or individual words are very important. Um, this is found within the guidelines as well. But what we have to understand is why do patients need thrombolysis? When there is a stroke, so essentially when you have an ischemic stroke, ischemic, it means that um, your blood, uh, there's a blood clot found within your brains, okay? And the first thing you want to deal with essentially is to sort of um, 
alleviate that clot. Um, and the process in which we do this is called thrombolysis. So this is when you use what we call clot busting um, drugs. And a key drug we use um, that will be found in a lot of formularies guidelines is what we call Alteplase. So essentially, um, this is a tissue plasminogen activator. What they do is they bind to the substance we call fibrin or fibrin and fibrin essentially is what causes is what stimulates blood to clot so once it binds to this what happens is it actually promotes the production of plasmin and some of you may be quite familiar with it it's a type of um, enzyme that helps to disintegrate the blood clots within um, your systemic circulation so as soon as alteplase is being um, alteplase is being administered um, it will immediately bind to the fibrins. It will reach um, sort of like the blood vessels within your brains um, and help to um, basically unclot, um, unclot the blood and allow for blood flow within your brains. And it, um, and this actually prevents you from basically deteriorating, increases your um, mortality rate as um, decreases your mortality rate as well. So, but the most important thing is not all patients can undergo this procedure. And the first important thing is we have to make sure we know for a fact the patient does not have um, intracranial hemorrhagic stroke. So uh, a hemorrhagic stroke is essentially different actually from ischemic stroke because it is where um, there's actually more I believe it is bleeding within your brain. So it's bleeding around or um, within the blood vessels um, in, in your brain. So essentially it's different to how um, ischemic stroke would come about. So if the patient does have hemorrhagic stroke, you cannot undergo um, thrombolysis. This is not applicable to um, that condition. And we also have to know exactly when the patient had onsets of symptoms of the stroke. So if you look back at this case study, um, they basically said the care found the patient um, at 8.30. They were then brought to um, A&E at 9 a.m. So we sort of know that the onset of symptoms was around 30 minutes to an hour, but we have to know exactly that it is within that range of time because Alteplase is mostly effective when given within 4.5 hours. If more, actually, it's it's not really necessary. And if anything, um, it doesn't really help with um, increasing the survival rate of the patient because at that point, the blood clot would have um, expanded and um, it would have spread. And, and therefore, the patient basically it just would not be as effective. Um, in fact, NICE guideline actually recommended if you can give it within an hour, it is almost um, triple um, the amount of effectiveness if you were to give it in three hours in which the onset um, of symptoms uh, appeared. So yeah, so this is the main procedure that we use. Um, and hopefully you know this um, because <laughs> I think we've been taught um, within our curriculum as well um, what the immediate management is. And if we go to the next question, which is also applicable. Yeah, just before we do, I just want to say... Yeah. We talk, Alteplase is absolutely a gold standard, but we spoke a little bit earlier about um, influ factors that influence and one of them being supply issues. And Alteplase is actually going through a bit of a stock issue at the moment. So a lot of trusts, hospital trusts in particular, are having to switch to things like low molecular weight heparin, um, which is not gold standard, but still does the job. So that's just something else to be aware of um, that may influence certain decisions. Thanks, Key. Yeah, absolutely. So it is basically looking at what is available within your region and then also using evidence-based medicines as well. It's not always if that if the option provided within the formulary guidelines are not available. Okay. The next question follows: what which of the following is an appropriate treatment plan following her stroke? So this is after she has been administered with Alteplase. Um, the clots have cleared. Um, however, we need to put her on long-term management of her stroke. So let's see. Yeah, let's see which medication is most appropriate for this patient. Oh, wow. Okay, so we're getting 
very mixed answers. Um, this is also another example of an answer that has very minuscule changes to each of the options, but that's why reading it through and understanding exactly what each of the answers is trying to tell you it is very important. It's very key. Okay, I think we can, yeah, we can stop there. So, um, so there are more, a lot of people are, oh, Okay, that is so the answer is number one, but the majority of you um, said that aspirin, the third option was um, the correct answer. So this is actually an example of why, because with the stroke management, it is quite intricate in the sense where you would manage t, um, a, a transient ischemic attack differently to as you would an ischemic stroke and as you would to a hemorrhagic stroke. So this is why it's it's very important to then go back and understand what each what medication actually is applicable to each of these indications because they do defer. Um, but the correct answer is aspirin 300 milligram for two weeks, continue with clopidogrel uh, lifelong should the patient have no AF. And this patient does not have AF. So this is the most appropriate um, treatment. And I'll go into why as well. So essentially, uh, why is aspirin given? Why is clopidogrel given? Aspirin and clopidogrel, as we may already know, is um, they're antiplatelet drugs. And essentially, they work primarily um, by preventing your platelets, which help in the clotting of blood. It's basically, um, it plays a role in preventing the formation and the aggregation of these um, platelets. And essentially it prevents the formation of atherosclerosis um, and, and blockage of blood vessels, particularly your artery. Um, artery. Um, and you will see that a lot of antiplatelets will be prescribed for patients who has to prevent cardiovascular events. So um, if a patient were to have stroke or a patient has um, um, myocardial infarction, in the past, chances are they will be on a long-term antiplatelet medication. So this is to be expected, hence why this patient is then on um, clopidogrel 75 milligram for um, lifelong, basically. Um, however, if the patient were then to have atrial fibrillation, actually another medication could be expected to take, and it's not clopidogrel, it is an anticoagulant. So they work slightly differently to how antiplatelets would work, and essentially anticoagulants Platelets don't work on platelets, but they do work on a specific type of proteins. Um, and these proteins, essentially, they, they're clotting factors. So they inhibit the clotting factors that are involved in the coagulation uh, cascade. Um, what we mean by that, it's basically a series of chemical um, reactions that causes your blood to eventually clot. Um, and you can expect to see anticoagulants, you know, in within drug class like DOAX. Um, so example of that, like a Pixaban, Rivaroxaban. So as an, or, or warfarin as well, the patient cannot take a DOAC, whether that's because of age, their weight, um, then chances are they would be on warfarin, but warfarin in itself is also an anticoagulant. Um, you would be expected for patients to take these um, if they are presented with, like I said, um, atrial fibrillation um, to prevention of like DVT um, or um, a venous thromboembolism as well. So clots and so clots basically in like your legs or P, um, um, pulmonary embolism. So in your lungs. So yeah. So essentially, these are two different drugs. They they're two di they're two different drug classes. They work. Um, very differently. However, they are um, sort of provided for patients in order to prevent the formation of blood clots in the future um, and uh, essentially for secondary prevention. And I will go to that as well. They, it does fall into sort of like the secondary prevention of um, a cardiovascular event in the future uh, as well. Okay. Next question. So what is the most appropriate uh, statin treatment for this patient following the stroke? That was very fast, guys. <laughs> okay. We're, we do get, I think this is very interesting because we are getting a lot of um, Nick's answer for um, these questions, which I think is good. And it's, it really informs the importance of then undergoing back and understanding um, what, what each medication is for, what is the correct dose um, 
but essentially, so the patient has had a stroke, essentially that causes them as having a cardiovascular event. If that is the case, then we have to start the patient on what we call the secondary prevention and starting them on a statin. Um, basically they have to be on a high intensity statin. So a torvastatin 80 milligram is an example of a high intensity statin. Essentially we, and, and the goal of that is we want to reduce their non HDL cholesterol level in three months time by at least 40% as well. Um, if you look at this table over here, what I mean by um, high intensity, there's, you know, there's different intensity of statins, there's high intensity, medium intensity, low intensity, and it really depends on basically whether or not the patient has had a cardiovascular event, whether uh, it depends on preferences as well for which um, statin they would like. Um, it also depends on whether they um, have any adverse effects to statins, which sometimes higher dose, they may experience side effects. Um, when one of the side effects that is rare, but has been reported by patients um, is myalgia or um, myopathy. So if the patients were to experience myopathy, chances are they could be stopped on a statin and restarted on a lower dose or a low intensity statin. So we are looking at um, prescribing this patient with a high intensity statin because the evidence basically say that they will work more effectively at reducing their bad cholesterol. Um, that would be the atorvastatin 80 milligram. But if we look at the percentage in which these statin at particular doses reduces their LDL cholesterol, it the 80 milligram almost coincide with resuvastatin 40 milligram dose. And then again, if you go and look into resuvastatin, some patients also cannot have resuvastatin because the dose in itself may be contraindicated due to patients' um, risk as well. So I think it's always good to know what are the it's good to look at all the patient factors. For instance, um, pregnancy may also mean that the patient cannot be on a higher dose of statin and they may have to then be reduced to a 20 milligram dose and not go on an 80 milligram dose. Um, but yeah, so this is basically, so it is guide, it is standard guideline um, to start the patient on 80 milligrams. But like I said, it really is important to have that communication with the patient, making sure that all their bloods um, come back and are within range. So if we're looking at liver function um, as well. We want to make sure that they're all within range. If the patient has poor liver function or hepatic function, then chances are they cannot be on a high dose of statins. And for instance, if a patient comes back and says, well, I have signs of like, um, muscle weakness, muscle aches that could be related to their um, statin intake, but we have to rule that out. So what we do, essentially, we get the patient in for another blood test. Uh, we check their um, creatine um, kinase, and that will show us whether or not there's going to be breakdown of muscle cells, and that would indicate that the statin could be the issue, and it may need to be stopped entirely, or it may be continued or switched to a different type of statin or switched to a lower dose. Um, so yeah, but that would be the answer for that question. And um, next question, please. Lovely. Okay. So next question ask, which of the following should be avoided if the patient is taking amlodipine? Okay. Interesting. Okay, I think we can end up there. Lovely. Okay, so the majority of you um, got it right. It is simvastatin 40. I think some of you may have thought it was resuvastatin as well. Um, resuvastatin at 10 milligram um, is not it is fine to be taken with amlodipine, but specifically it's the simvastatin. That is the specific type of statin that I want you to understand. Actually, we have to, that is a bit of a red flag when it's prescribed with amlodipine. The main reason for that, and this is not applicable, so you can prescribe a torvastatin at 20 or 40 milligram dose. However, when you hit the simvastatin 40 milligram dose, um, this is when you have to query it a little bit because Simvastatin in itself, um, if we look back into like the mechanism, how it works, it is metabolized by the, um, I think it is the cy um, cytochrome, was it the cytochrome P450 
or the um, CYP3A4 enzyme. But essentially, it would be metabolized primarily by that specific enzyme. And what amlodipine does, actually, it's a weak inhibitor of the CYP3A4 um, enzyme. So if you think about it, they're actually sort of like, um, they're not contraindicated. However, they act opposite to each other um, that causes that interaction between those two drugs. And essentially what it does is if you prescribe those two um, together at simvastatin 14 milligram, it causes the statin dose to be increased because there's poor um, sort of clearance of it. There's poor me um, metabolism of, of the statin. So yeah, it causes your um, statin uh, levels to increase within your bloods or your circulation. And therefore, some patients may come back presenting with symptoms of um, myopathy again. So, um, and that is is clearly indicated because, you know, they can come back um, saying that they have muscle aches, muscle weakness. Um, and then if you, you know, take their blood tests, you can then determine, oh, actually it is because the statin's not being cleared um, correctly or not, or not cleared entirely. So yeah, the... And the NICE guideline does um, have this uh, sort of, um, they do have uh, a statement about this as well. So the statin, simvastatin 40 milligram is not recommended. And actually it should be simvastatin 20 milligram. So only simvastatin 20 milligram and not more, um, only less could be prescribed then with the um, amlodipine. And this is because of this um, significant interaction. So it should not exceed the 20 milligram gram dose. And actually, if you prescribe sort of simvastatin, um, yeah, so if you prescribe the dose, uh, it, it is almost equivalent to, if you prescribe simvastatin 20, either with amlodipine 5 or 10, it's almost like doubling the dose of the simvastatin. So it's almost like taking simvastatin 40. So you can also overdose the patient as well. Thanks, Sue. <laughs> okay, next question. Okay. So the question begs, the patient would like to quit smoking, ask you for advice. And which of the following is the best way to approach the situation? So this is um, following through with management, further management of the patient. So we've looked at pharmacological management. Now we can look at the non-pharmacological management. And it's also an important aspect of what we do as pharmacists as well. So essentially, if the patient comes to us and say, I want to quit smoking or I want to reduce my... Um, intake of, of alcohol. Um, we are also responsible to sort of like help the patient facilitate that. So yeah. Okay. I think, yeah, I think the majority of us <laughs> have answered it. So um, the correct answer is number three. Um, and the thing is with each of these answers well, so this is another example of, I think, what is it key? The single best single best answer? Yeah, because we can say that each of these answers, they're not incorrect. They're not completely incorrect. Um, and if anything, there is some truth to each of them being a, a, pos a plausible option. However, we have to rationalize which option is more, it coincides with delivering the, that patient-centered care, delivering that holistic care, holistic approach, um, and also shows that we as pharmacists are taking responsibility for the patient, for, for giving them the best quality of care. So if we look at number one, for instance, um, we can encourage her to quit immediately. Now, you know, one thing we know about um, telling a patient to quit something immediately or quit cold turkey, especially when it's um, an addiction like smoking, is that it can also increase the risk of them getting withdrawal symptoms. Um, and this could be even more problematic in the future, could prevent them from actually quitting altogether. So you can expect withdrawal symptoms to show up as like patients feeling more anxious, more fatigued, more um, um, agitated, tired. They can, you know, and, and these are some of the barriers that, that will then stop the patient from taking the next step and quitting altogether. In fact, it can cause them to relapse again and start smoking again. So this is where we have to say, actually, this may not be the best advice. Um, and we have to explain to the patient why this as well. Patient education is so key and so important because, um, you know, there's a, they may sort of understand certain concepts a different way, like quitting smoking altogether. They may be told by other people that, yes, I've, I've, I've quit smoking all at once. It worked for me. But the thing is, it's personalized um, personalized patient care that we deliver. So we have to engage with the patient and understand, actually, is this the best way 
to approach this um, method for this patient. Another thing to understand as well with smoking, patients develop psychological dependence on smoking. Sometimes it's the act of smoking and the social aspect of smoking that brings them, that, that makes them want to keep smoking. So we have to sort of understand that, um, ask, you know, use that open-ended questions, ask them and, and, and really engage with them. Um, there's also techniques that we as pharmacists can use like motivational interviewing as well, which is quite important. Um, and number two, we can say, okay, so number two, advise her discuss this with her GP. Like I said, this comes back to the whole idea of taking a holistic approach. It just seems that to, to sort of agree with the statement is to say that we're not going to take responsibility and we are, we're going to sort of leave that responsibility to someone else, um, you know, and if, if that's the case of like, you don't feel competent to advise the patient, that would be understandable to an extent. However, we also are there to advise to the best of our abilities as well. So if we don't have that information with us then and there, we can signpost them to then resources that they can go and learn and educate themselves during their free time. So that's where the answer number three comes in more handy. So we can offer them non-judgmental support. So like I said, um, giving them that support, asking them, you know, um, why is it that you want to quit or what? Um, so how determined are you to quit on a scale to one to 10? Um, why is um, quitting smoking important to you? And really gauging where sort of like the scale of change um, that they are in at that moment and then signposting to them the relevant services. So the stopping um, stop smoking services um, that is provided by the NHS, then they can then help her with that process of understanding how she can quit smoking and provide her with the relevant treatment as well. Number four, um, so we can, okay, we can choose to provide her information and tell her all the harmful effects of smoking, why smoking is bad. Chances are the patient already knows that. Chances are this is sort of something that she has been, um, you know, that she's been drilled with for, for the longest time that, because if she is a smoker, chances are, you know, people have been trying to tell her about this. There's a lot of stigma that comes with um, picking up an addictive habit like this as well. So you sort of going there and telling her the same thing everyone else around is telling her is I think it's not going to be beneficial in the long run and really it's not going to um, strike that change attitude so yeah I wouldn't say that would be the best approach so I think I think approach number three but everyone does you know if you guys have a different opinion or if you guys feel like um, doing more than just that then that is completely applicable as well um, you can always add that in the chat as well Okay, next question. Okay, and this is, um, I think this is the last question, isn't it? Yeah, okay, lovely. <laughs> so um, which of the following nicotine replacement therapy is not suitable for use in this patient? Oh, well, okay, interesting. Well, so you guys are answering questions. I just had um, a point come to my head. Um, I think for your case before, you know, about smoking, I think in this scenario, it's less important, but um, like in, with regards to drugs, but, you know, stuff like theophylline, um, like about stopping smoking does um, affect dosing. So um, it's just bearing in mind that sometimes smoking, it's not nicotine. I don't think it's nicotine that affects it, but um, it can induce uh, CYP3A4. Um, and then that can like help you metabolize meds faster. So um, just bear in mind that there are some meds out there that might need like a change in dose if you do end up stopping smoking. Yeah, absolutely, Sue. Thank you. Actually, that is an important point. And I think I came across that case um, back in uni as well. Of So this is a case where actually a patient should not stop smoking abruptly or should not stop smoking unless they've, they're have they off, they're finishing that course. Is it an antibiotic or...? What is the medication you were mentioning? Um, theophylline is normally for asthma um, and like rest conditions. I'm not sure if any antibiotics have that. Um, theophylline is like the only one I know, or aminophylline, but they're from the same drug class. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So wh while the patient is taking that particular medication, they should not stop smoking or they should, if they were to, they have to um, basically consult someone, a healthcare professional, preferably. Okay. All right. So... A lot of you have very mixed um, answers. And actually there's two answers to this question. Um, 
So the majority did get the majority did get that right. Um, but there is also another answer, which is the nicotine gum. So if you remember, the patient has dyspepsia, they have inflammation in their gastric lining, um, and therefore is taking, I think, Gaviscon for it as well. But essentially, if you really think about the nicotine gum, so when you're, you know, just about the formulation in itself, there's a greater chance that the patient may swallow the gum, and this could be dislodged within their gastric lining and basically... Um, um, aggravates her current condition um, and might cause her to even have risk of ulcerations or risk of gastric bleeding. So I would say nicotine gum is definitely not, it would not be the best um, NRT treatment for this patient, particularly because of its formulation. Um, but if the patient does not, if the patient is not contraindicated, um, being that they don't have any gastric issues, chances are they could be, they, they can be commenced on nicotine gum. Um, nicotine patches um, is fine. That is appropriate for the patient. Um, I think ver verenicline, yep, that is okay as well. And that is, I think, the um, in accordance to PGD as well. So that is recommended for patients. Um, I'm not sure if it's first line, but it is. Does anybody know if it's first line? No. I will have to actually look <laughs> into that. But it is um, uh, recommended by most of the stop smoking services if patient were to commence an NRT. Um, bupropion is interesting because actually it's no longer manufactured in the UK. So I don't think any, any patients would be able to get on this treatment. Um, so yeah, it's been withdrawn by manufacturing um, companies and therefore um, chances are you will not see a patient being prescribed it. But this is simply because it's no longer available. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you want to add anything else to this. Um... Yeah, the only other thing I was going to add, the interesting thing about gum is just the action of chewing gum. It, the way it works in your body, it causes your stomach to release more acid. Um, so not only is there a bigger risk of the gum being swallowed, but your your the body is reacting, producing more acid, creating acidic environment, which is going to lead potentially to stomach ulceration. So that's the other thing that you would want to think about um, is how your body might react to certain things. But Sally, I think you had a, a question in the Q and A. Um, so while you do that, what I'm gonna do everybody is there is a feedback form that we'd like everybody to fill out. Shouldn't take you longer than five minutes. Um, this is just to help us with our webinars um, and the way that we plan and organize things. So as much feedback as we can get is so, so appreciated from you guys. So we can only improve and only make it better for you guys. That aim is to have many more of these in the future. Um, so the more feedback we get, the better we can make these. So um, yeah, if you could just fill in the form, that would be amazing. And then Sally, if you wanted to answer the question in the Q&A and then we'll sort of sum up. Yeah, perfect. I was just gonna type it, but I realized I could just answer it. <laughs> um, so it is um, recommended by the uh, NICE guideline that to know if a stess is working is, is essentially to see that in three months time, um, at least 40% of their um, non-HDL or their LDL cholesterol has gone down. Um, if it hasn't, chances are if you're not, if the patient is not taking the, um, if the patient is not taking the highest dose of statin, they could potentially increase their dose of statin to then help push into that target. But essentially it is just, it is a target and um, it does vary between different patients. I mean, chances are, you know, it, it, it does now beg the question of like, it could be patient adherence, poor adherence to their statins could potentially um, prevent them from meeting this target. But it's also important because monitoring like this will then help to promote that communication between the healthcare professional and the patient so they can better support how the patient can take the, that medication and what dose would, would benefit them more, if that makes sense. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you for that, Sally. So we are at the end of the webinar. Um, we really hope from this that you've kind of got a better understanding of clinical decision making and factors that influence prescribing. And to any of you who are going to be qualifying subscribers, we hope that you've kind of got a little bit more confidence about maybe writing prescriptions um, and trainees about when to question and, and where to look for certain things. Um, and we hope you enjoyed the case studies as well. Um, we as trainees know how much we love a good case study. Um, but if anybody does have any questions, then please do put them in the chat or the Q&A. Please do fill in the feedback form. Um, all of your feedback, positive and negative, is really, really appreciated. Um, but otherwise, 
that is it for the end of the webinar. So if anybody has any final questions or any final thoughts from the team, now is the time to say so. It's really good to hear that you guys enjoyed it, by the way. A lot of work went into this. So it's so nice to hear that you guys have enjoyed it. Yes, we are so grateful. I think it was fun preparing it. Um, so we're just very happy that everyone enjoyed. Yeah.